Okay, ladies, it's us tonight. Thank you for coming. And this is week six. I mean, I know Doug snuck an extra week in there, but as far as the content is, this is, we are halfway through. We are into the nitty gritty as it is. But I, and since it is just us, I hope you guys will feel good maybe to talk about the journal prompts from last week, um, because I think, honestly, that is the core of everything is finding out the motivations as to why we do anything, right? So that's what we're trying to do. And I think when we began this course, my, my goal was to help us understand how we formed our stories. And so we've been looking week after week after week at all these different aspects of what creates this. But what ends up happening over our lifetime is this becomes a narrative. This becomes a narrative, who we believe we are. And unfortunately, and fortunately, because we're learning along the way, but we, it's, it's like any other boundary driven belief, we get into this defense stance. And so be it politics or religion, or the right way to parent and the wrong way to parent, the right way to eat, the wrong way, the right way to exercise. Believe me, you know people who attach to this is the only way you should eat, clean eating, vegetarian, you know, this plan, this plan, or exercise. Um, they used to just make so much, <laughs> not fun, but, oh, geez, now I can't think, uh, CrossFit. And it was like the gospel of CrossFit, and everybody, they talked about it, and it was the only way to do it. So CrossFit, vegan, you know, all of these things become a narrative, and it's like when Doug was going through with spiral dynamics. It's not until we get to one of those unworkable times or something where we're going, well, is that always right? Is that, you know, and we begin to question. So that's what we're talking about tonight is questioning. So when we looked at these, um, our motives, our, our, our core motivations, you might be tempted to go, okay, so, for a type one, what is wrong with striving to be good? Absolutely nothing. And so should type ones not strive to be good and have integrity? Of course not, of course not. And we all have all of these desires. Um, even, you know, if we're looking at the type four who says, I wanna be, I wanna be unique. Or, I don't wanna just be another face in the crowd or, or a census number are one of those things. We, we all want that, right? So we know, though, that we have some core motives, and those are the ones that kind of run the show. But I have, I say always, since my kids were teenagers, and my oldest is 44, so it's been a while, um, I've always said we do everything we do out of one or two uh, drives. It's either love or fear. And I say this about my, my son because when he was a teenager, and I would say that everything we do is out of love or fear. What are you feeling right now? And he was like, Mom, I'm not taking a shower out of love or fear. I'm taking a shower because I'm dirty. And I said, Well, let's look at that. Is it because you love being clean or you're afraid that you'll go to school? And somebody will say, You're, you stink. <laughs> and he just was like, oh, <laughs> like, so, but when we peel back all of that, really, it really comes down to that. And it, that is such a simple question. I mean, we are going to look at more questions. But when you sit with that and you think, okay, I, and I hope I'm not jumping ahead of myself. It's okay. But let's say, um, as a type two, but I want, I want to help people. I love helping people. Just to sit with that one question, well, is it truly because you love it? Are you afraid if you don't meet everybody's needs that you won't be loved? So love or fear, love or fear plays into this very well. And, and honestly, if you learn any, nothing else about the questions that we're gonna go through later, I hope that's one that it'll just kind of stick in your brain and go, oh, 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 
is this, is this a fear thing? You know, I want to eat right. Is it because I want a healthy body or I'm afraid, you know, I'm going to gain weight or I'm going to get as, or whatever the thing is, if you don't eat just the right clean eating and all of that. So, um, I, before we go into this, um, I know these were some kind of like almost prying into your soul questions with the journal prompts, but did any of the three or four questions that I had at, on these um, hit either of you in a way that's like, mm, okay, I get that. And did you understand, like the first thing I said, um, when you attach to that identity, what role do you play in your family? So I am the one who makes sure the entertainment is taken care of, that the positivity stays up. Well, if I'm not that one, am I still loved? That's what I'm saying about being, we play these roles in our families. So Lee, did you have any? insight into any of those um yeah the definitely and all of the um attachment and control words uh all rang pretty true and heavy for me um but in thinking about it through the lens of the fear part the i i am the one who does things right uh reinforces the whole mistakes aren't okay in a different way and one of the ways that it comes up is um i mean it um it has to do with hypocrisy like if i don't do stuff right i can't expect other people to do things right and if you know there's some sort of um like bargain i'm trying to make with reality <laughs> that I'll do it and so then more people will do it. like it's 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 almost like a peer pressure in one direction like I'm going to example the daylights out of doing this thing right <laughs> mm. um and and I'm not consciously thinking any of this stuff right it's just like um I'll give you a kind of a silly example um my husband clay and i are both um like rabid iced tea drinkers lots of iced tea gets drunk here and then there's assorted citruses that go into the iced teas right and so there's a little bit of a um kind of that cliche like who's going to put the change the toilet paper roll it's like who's going <laughs> to yeah. slice the lemon right the person who uses the last lemon needs to slice up the lemon and I have this whole protocol about like not tossing the leftover lemon in the sink and leaving it there, right? Um, and one time in the before times, when my husband was traveling for work, like I've said to him a thousand times, please, please take the lemon out of the sink, right? Well, he was gone for like a week and somehow there was still lemon in the sink, right? <laughs> like, how'd that happen? <laughs> so always not me right um and so just like seeing how I um can exempt myself from my own rules and rationalizing why that is you know but I'm always having to rationalize why and and that is is informative to me right instead of just like well I didn't do it at that time period, end of sentence. It's like, well, I didn't do it, but here's why. Mm. And then that means it wasn't wrong because I had this reason. Ah. Right? And so that's, that's arresting. <laughs> you know, it's that's, like, oh. That's, that's a beautiful in, insight to even yeah. be able to reflect on that. You know, yeah. you, you did a, a beautiful story last night, uh, last week. And I just want to remind you how heart touching it was where you talked about you had made a mistake and, and apologizing to your son. Mm -hmm. We talk about being able to take down a wall. 
that will be something that he probably can remember, but that you gave yourself the grace to say, I'm going to say the words, I'm sorry. That, I, I mean, I, I know it probably was almost so painful because of that little judgment thing that goes inside of your voice that says, it's like you've said, it's not okay to make mistakes, but you did and life still went on. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, I, that's, yep, yeah, that's the, that's that, that wall, that boundary that I talked about earlier, that we build this shell around us that says, this is who I am. And if I, if I show somebody else that my narrative is flawed, well, then what else is broken about me? Right? And I say broken loosely. And we think that everybody judges us. And the truth is they're not thinking about us. At the moment, they might be like, oh, wow, okay. So she can have feelings or <laughs> whatever um, it is. And then they go on. But we become so imprisoned in our own walls. And again, I use those, those boundaries and boy, we have to defend them. And when we can't, when there's a, you know, a hole in that wall, it's, on, it's so uh, uh, scary. And then it's like, oh, I didn't die. I, I'm okay. And people still love me, right? Mm. Mary, what about you? Um, so I could really relate to, um, wanting to avoid pain and be satisfied. And in my family, I was probably, uh, too lenient on my sons because I wanted to avoid pain and, um, and they, um, they are 41 and 33. Um, and I was always concerned with, are they having a satisfactory life? And one of them is um, not in a good place. He has a mental illness. And um, so, I mean, I, I kind of have to just give that up and say, I'll do what I can. But, but that's been hard for me. And so to answer two, um, I get discouraged and frustrated when I'm not able to control, you know, that they have a satisfying life. And um, my, my other son um, is uh, 33 and hasn't had a girlfriend in 10 years or something. And I'm like, oh, is he okay? Does he have friends? And so I'm still trying to play that role with him. And um, what I do when I get frustrated with, okay, you know, I wish things were better for them. And my husband, he's retired and sometimes he's looking for direction is um, then I need to escape because I need some satisfaction <laughs> and some quality of life. And so then um, a lot of the escaping is going into the past or projecting what fun things we're gonna do in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I could really, relate to that and how this belief, um, how it's a limiting belief for me is, um, I think in some ways um, it limits my friendships because um, I wanna avoid pain. You get too close, you're not good. You're gonna have, you're gonna have a lot of pain. And, um, Probably it's limited me, as I said before, like in my parenting that I, um, I just, you know, don't want my, my sons to struggle. I haven't wanted that. Right. And um, I was reading this great book by Glennon, what's her name? Doyle. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I Finland love how, and we all know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. That's good. Well, um, I just love, I, this is the kind of parent I wish I had been. <laughs> this one girl, this one woman was saying, well, my son is 11 years old, but I think he might be looking at pornography on his phone, but he's only 11. <laughs> and Glennon said, tell him what you think, tell him your heart. If he isn't, it's not going to hurt him. And if he rolls his eyes at you, who cares? You're being real. You're being honest about making sure that he knows, um, you know, what, what love and sex are and, and, and doesn't think this is normal. And I thought that is so courageous. Um, but I don't like conflicts. <laughs> Oh let's all God. just be happy and satisfied with no conflict please <laughs> so that's those were the things I thought of I the question four I wasn't real sure about in my situation no, oh that's okay you didn't have to answer all of them and that's okay yeah um yeah just to open us up to looking at that what is my role what do I see as my role? And how does this, like um, Lee was talking about, how does this, how does it reflect on me in my own thinking? Or did somebody else notice this when I like break my own uh, rules and I'm not the standard bearer or I'm not the, you know, the joyful one all the time. Um, or I'm not the one who can spin this horrible situation. And I know as a seven, as well in my younger parenting, oh, I, I couldn't, oh, I couldn't stand conflict. In fact, we just hardly had it because we just moved right on. I have said this before. I've said it in a podcast. And so it's not anything new. But at one point when I was first married to my first husband, we were having an argument. And I literally said, can we just get into, you know, look a week ahead because we're going to get over this and we're not going to be mad at each other at, at most in a week. So can we just get over it right now and move to the happy part? Well, <laughs> absolutely not for him, <laughs> but I don't want, I did not want to sit in that, oh, the pain and the, the anger and all of that. Let's just, you know, catch the chase and be happy. Well, I don't have a lot of really vivid memories of the past, but for some reason that stuck in my head. And I think it was, you're going to need to reflect on this someday because escaping into the future and saying, we're going to just, you know, we don't need to deal with these hard parts right now. This is going to need to be something that you <laughs> um, work on someday. And it was, of course. It is. So I understand. I know that sitting in the, in, in the discomfort of anything, in the discomfort of being told, you know, you didn't, you didn't do this right. Or for a type two or whatever. No, I really don't need your help today. What? Or we could go through all of the numbers. So it's that attachment to the performance in our type. That gets in our way. So let me let's go into slide share, and all right. Oh, where is it? Oh dear. Let me just pause this recording for a minute. Okay, let me share this screen here. So. Module two, week six, we're gonna talk about this dissolving process. And I hope I'm not making anybody nauseous <laughs> by going through the gory parts of this transformation process, but it, it's nature and it is what it is. And I am gonna be like the um, quote queen tonight. I've got, I'm gonna share quotes from several people who just really speak to me, but, uh, I have to minimize this. Okay. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. 
Maya Angelou. So as I've said before, um, inside the chrysalis, a caterpillar's body, oh, this is mind blowing, digests itself from the inside out. The same juices it used to digest food as a larva, now it uses it to break down its own body. I cannot hardly wrap my brain around the sadness, the, what seems to be so such a painful surrender and the beauty of a process that allows this creature to surrender and use what it had used in its prior life to give it, to sustain it, the juices that digested, that kept it going so it could keep consuming and keep consuming. And now it's come to that place in its life cycle that it says, I'm going to take what nature gave me to stay in this form, to stay attached to the ground or whatever branch it is I'm crawling on. It's the only way I can go beyond the limitations of this boundary that keeps me in this form. It, to be able to release those imaginal discs. So a butterfly has to surrender its form. This, this blows my mind, science is amazing. <laughs> but the same information that we have used in our life to build the defense so we could form the identity or the sense of identity that we have created is the same thing that we are now able to go, okay, that served me when I was crawling. It served me when I needed to defend and figure out how to navigate life. And now it's time to say, do I need that anymore? This is a quote by Carl Jung. And it says, we cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what in the morning was true will in evening become a lie. So the question is, but how do we know what is true and what is no longer true? And how do we know when we are no longer in the morning? Well, it all starts with that right there, the questions, the questions. The quality of your life is a direct reflection of the quality of the questions you are asking. Tony Robinson, <laughs> I like Tony. And this is one that I have said before, I believe I ended it last week with this. It's not our thoughts, but our attachment to our thoughts that causes suffering. Attaching to a thought means believing that it's true without inquiring or questioning. A belief is a thought that we've been attaching to often for years. And that's Byron Katie. And so tonight I'm gonna look at the work, which is what Byron Katie call, calls her process is the work. Um, I'm gonna just take you through these, the first four questions. The work from Byron Katie is a really in-depth process. This is just the beginning, but I'm not really, I'm not um, certified to teach or whatever. And I don't want to take you away from the simple process of learning to question. So um, Mary, I know you have looked at Byron Katie and Lee, I don't know. I don't remember if you're familiar with her or not. Um, I am, I'm, I know just enough to be dangerous today. Oh. Um, <laughs> I know the the concept of the work and the four questions, and I have played with it sort of from a distance. Well, there's a whole other process that beyond this that's called the turnaround. And so it's not that I'm ignoring this. If you get into looking at it later, it's it's kind of <laughs> it's a mind puzzle in turning these questions around. Um, that really is some great, great work. And I love 
I love this work. It's very, ooh, to pull these, to pull these things out. And she has some wonderful videos. If you ever just, you know, do a YouTube search and um, watch her go through this process with somebody. And she starts with a question. And then because they, they'll come with a statement. I need this thing. I want my mother to appreciate me. And then she ends up turning those questions around like, I don't want my mother to appreciate me. I want me to appreciate me. I want my mother to appreciate me. And all the ways you can turn these questions around until your, your mind is like, what? <laughs> what just happened here? But it's a beautiful process. But if nothing else, I believe these four questions can be just as um, helpful as just asking, is this something I do from love or fear? Love or fear? That is, those are two really powerful questions. But the work... Her four questions are, is it true? So let's take um, a type, you know, let's just do one. Let's take a type two who says, if I didn't help him, he would never go to work on time. If I didn't help him get up, he would miss work every day, you know, husband or child or whatever living at home. So that's a simple one and pretty easy to, to do this um, questioning with because the qu first question is, is that true? And you might very well say, yes, that is true. He sleeps right past the alarm clock. And so you ask again, can you absolutely know that's true? And it's always like, well, Okay, I can't 100% say that that's the truth, but it's been the pattern all along, or this is the way um, I, I know it to be because you've developed this mental picture and gotten to this pattern of he sleeps past the alarm clock, he doesn't wake up, he doesn't wake up. I can't stand the thought that he's not going to, so I'm going to help him because this is what's good for him. This is what's best for him, is to get to his job. And so you say, well, I don't know. I've never really let him sleep past the alarm to see what would happen. So I can't know. I can't say it's 100% true. So how do you feel when you believe that thought, if I don't help him, it won't get done? So what happens? So we begin to question, if I don't do this thing, if I don't, and you fill in your blank, then we know what happens. Our bodies begin to react. And so in this, time, in this situation, if you've ever been through this, and I'll tell you something in a minute, um, you know that you, you begin to tense up, you might get you know a little bit sweaty or you're Cheeks will get flushed because you're beginning to get angry. I shouldn't have to do this. I shouldn't have to do this. He should be responsible. But if I don't do it, he won't do it. And ah, uh, so you, you get this whole emotion going on in your body that brings about the frustration, the tension, the anger, all of the emotions that go with the thing that you have determined is a, a truth, right? It's a truth. And so the first... Fourth question is, who would you be without that thought? Seems so simple, but really, if you did not have the thought that you just had that produced the reaction, then the answer is, well, I'd probably be calm and feel pretty good. And this is just the process. So when the question or the, the truth of your matter enters your head, this is a truth. And if I don't, for a type seven, if, if I don't find a way out of this, the tears, this painful situation, then the tears will come, I'll fall apart, I won't be in control. And it's like, well, is that true? What would happen if you just sat and cried and let, let the pain out? Well, I might actually feel 
more human. Like I don't have to defend myself against pain and suffering. That everybody else experiences this and, oh, guess what? I'm okay. And people will still love me. So this is just a, a whole process that if you begin to question yourself, it kind of becomes like almost automatic, or at least that's the, the goal is to say, when I get stuck in a defense mode, can I question that thought? And so when we consider the motivations that we just talked about, whether we do that from love or fear, let's use the four questions to begin inquiry. And so I've just gone through each of the types. I'm afraid I won't be loved if I'm not good. So you would ask, well, is that true? That you won't be loved if you're not good? And I've gone through each one of the types. If I'm not this, then I won't be loved. This is the defense that we've put up to guarantee our safety, security, and our love. So who would you be without that thought? It's a question to say, is it time to dissolve my attachment to that thought? Once again, the thoughts that I want to be good and have integrity, those are not bad. That I want to be helpful, and uh, help people in need, that's not a bad thought. To be successful, I really wanna be successful. That motivation is not, is not negative, it's not bad. To be unique, to be competent, um, to have the answers, to find if there's for the type six. I like, it's good to be prepared. If I go through, all of the worst case scenarios and I'm prepared for whatever it is we're doing, that's not bad. That's not a bad motive. It's when we attach to that and if I don't do it, then the world will fall apart, the team will be destroyed uh, and my job as the one who does that, my, my security and love will be threatened and taken away because suddenly I'm not, I'm not worthy anymore. Type eight, type nine, the type nine, you know, what would happen if there was conflict? Would I lose that relationship really? And so you question, well, what if I actually say, I'm so angry about this situation? <gasps> I tell you what, when a type nine does get angry, <laughs> Katie bar the door. <laughs> so these are just, uh, the beginnings of the way we inquire about the motives, the automatic, the default system that seems to be running the show. And so I love all of the times that we can find a tool that helps us. But the one thing I know is and I have, trust me, this has been something that I have had to work on. The only time I can confront that is when I am aware, when I'm in the present moment, when I'm conscious of my thoughts. I love how Byron Katie calls this meditation. And a lot of us, you know, I don't know if y'all meditate. Meditation was something I never thought I could do. And then you get people that are very attached to their forms of meditation. So it's like, well, I, you have to do it this way, or you know, this is the right way to do it. So Byron gave me, I felt like she gave me permission to just say, anytime you're in the moment and you pause and you contemplate that question, that's a meditation. You're meditating on that truth. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but she is right. You can't meditate on that question in the past or in the future. You can reflect on something that happened in the past, but you can only do that right now. So when I use the term higher consciousness, I don't know that I've used it in this course, 
conscious awareness, conscious transformation. It almost sounds like total enlightenment. <laughs> and it, it can come across as you think you know it. Um, to me, higher consciousness simply means not living from lower consciousness. And all that is, is acting in unawareness. When you're just running on autopilot. Oh, you can't see my hands down here. We're, <laughs> we're just uh, letting those automatic default programs run the show, as I say. I believe higher, all higher consciousness is, is rising your awareness to present consciousness so you can contemplate. There is no um, level of, oh, you have now reached a level of the highest consciousness and now you're a guru and I give you a certificate for being enlightened. If people <laughs> are trying to convince you of something like that, I, I say, no, thank you. So this is really a short um, class because I've given you the 28 page PDF, which you, you don't have to read all of it, but she goes through that and actually goes through a scenario where they're doing the work together. And that's kind of cool to see her process. It's really much cooler to me if you watch her do it. Oh, she's just so tender. And yet, in a way she confronts what seems so obvious. You can hear the audience laugh like, oh, silly. Surely you saw that one coming. But when you're in that seat, you don't. And I will, I tell you, we were watching um, a friend, I'll just say that, wanted to, for us to see a Byron Katie uh, video. And we, we both watched it. And at the end, he was going, see, see? And, and Doug and I, we were <laughs> later, we were like, did you not see? Did you not see? Because <laughs> it, it hit us differently. So when you are in the seat and you're the one doing the, or being um, confronted with the questions, you're gonna see things and feel things that the audience, they may see it differently um, and react like, oh, how could you not see that? It's funny, we can't see our own issues sometimes until we, again, begin the inquiry. Okay, so I'm going to email you your journal prompt for next week. And um, I have, I'm sending a guide that just is, it's the guide to her questions, how to approach the questions. I've just given you the four questions. And so there's just, just a little, it's just one page, but it's just a little bit more explanation, ex, yeah, explanation as to how. Just when you ask that first question, she just draws it out a little bit more. And so I've, I've given you ways to go back and look at these in consideration of our childhood wounded message or some of the other um, things that we've learned along the way about our Enneagram type. But the Enneagram can also become a narrative and we almost treat it like the gospel. I did hear a lady who teaches the Enneagram say one time, the Enneagram can solve every problem. <laughs> and <laughs> I wanted to say, is that true? <laughs> is that 100% true? I love what the Enneagram has brought into my life. I love the awareness it's brought me and Doug and our relationships. Again, if this doesn't enhance my relationship, doesn't mean anything. It's just more information. And I have a lot of information going on all the time. Um, so you don't have to look back. I mean, I made these questions, these worksheets out a long time ago. I'm not going to modify them because you may want to look from your Enneagram pers perspectives that we've talked about, but you are also 
invited and encouraged to use other life situations. Like I said, I need to wake him up. It's, it's my, I need to help him. These are, you know, not really Enneagram questions, except in the fact that that might be your motivation. That might be the show that runs in the back. I have to help. And I'm using twos right now because I don't have two <laughs> here right now. So it's, oh, and it's two, it's two day. <laughs> so we're honoring and celebrating our twos, but I'm also using them a little bit. So at the back of all of these uh, things that we do overall might be that voice that says it's up to me to be the one to provide the plan for everybody if I'm six. And that's, but if you drill down to specific situations and it could be uh, with a person that you've got a conflict with, and it usually is, that might be an interesting way to just dig a little deeper beyond just the Enneagram. So next week, we're going to talk a little Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> my favorite <laughs> so yeah next week we're gonna talk about another aspect of what our mind holds on to and it's called the pain body are y'all familiar with the pain body it's a mind blower so it's it's really, it's yet another tool. And again, when I did this course outline, I was very clear in saying, yes, we're gonna use the Enneagram, but this is our doorway. This is our doorway into looking at other um, tools and things that have helped it, um, broaden my perspective. And I would also ask if you, when we're through with this, if you have things that you're like, you really should probably read so-and-so. I'm always interested. Um, Doug is reading some stuff now that's it's physics and um, he's reading a book called Cosmic Hologram and how we, how we are so connected and on the particle level and blah, blah, blah and all of this stuff. And, I know. So you can't read everything, but if you guys have recommendations, I would love to hear what's really meant a lot to you in your journey. Okay. Any questions or comments? I have to tell good you this. Stuff. Oh, go ahead. What? I just said good stuff. Oh, oh, good. I'm glad good you Doug and I were in a class one time when I was talking about the alarm clock and I, I just thought of it. I hadn't planned to say this, but we were in a parenting class and Doug and I were newlyweds of a blended family. So we we're like, we might go there. And the teacher said, it's so difficult to raise teenagers. He said, my teenage daughter, she sets her alarm clock every day and then she just turns it off and goes right back to sleep. And these, these are challenges with teenagers. And Doug and I were like, oh no, you have no idea. <laughs> if that was our challenge, we would be grateful for that. So anyway, it's all perspective. All right, nine o'clock folks. I appreciate you guys so much. I will stop the recording now.